I noticed something about myself. <laughs> I've noticed I'm getting older. Wow, that's a shock. <laughs> but up until this year, I really hadn't slowed down much. I had actually kind of increased my workload and pretty much was doing more in my day than what I did when I was younger and was pretty much amazed by that. But I'll admit this last, oh, I guess winter, even though I've got a lot done, I mean, some days when I decide to work, boy, boom, crunch, I get tons of stuff done. But I had noticed that in reality, when it comes to all the things that I would like to do in my day, I'd have to say that, yeah, I'm slowing down, beginning to do less, maybe accomplish more, but at the same time, I seem to be doing less. I'm hoping that's going to lead me to appreciate more. You know, instead of trying to do more and be more and get more and look more and appear more, maybe do less, but have the quality of it in such a way that the intensity gives off that great awareness that less sometimes is more. It's always the reverse of what we most often think about when it comes to God. God oftentimes does the opposite of what we think. His thoughts aren't our thoughts, neither are His ways our ways. We think that bigger is better. And the truth is, He doesn't do it that way. He defines it down smaller and smaller and smaller. Many are called, few are chosen. Gideon wound up being led by God to reduce his army to such a small number that in the end, it had to have been God that gave them the victory because they couldn't have done it themselves. And they knew it. <laughs> But you know, we in America want bigger. We want better. We want more. You see a lot of people get that way. You know, they they somehow have to have more, so they get more energy drinks. You know, they want to hype themselves up even more and get faster and quicker and longer and do more. I'm kind of like not into that. You know, I'm going the opposite direction. I'm kind of like leaving off of those things that most people do to hype themselves. And I'm kind of like looking for peace and love. You know, joy and contentment, kindness, tenderness, the sensitivity of being able to stop for a minute and see that squirrel that's running around in the trees. Or maybe the movement of the Spirit of God as he moves in the gentlest of breeze. Maybe hearing a quiet voice speaking to me softly to turn to the left or the right. Maybe, just maybe, the movement in heaven is so slow that we can't see it because we're moving too fast. Think about that. Consider that thought at some point in time in your life. Are you moving so fast that you're missing heaven because it's moving so slow? Streams in the desert, I enjoy because it's often I turn to when I feel kind of like, <sighs> you know, low energy levels or low sugar levels or just feeling kind of tired or down. And God always speaks to me for some reason in streams in the desert at a time when I need to hear from him. And personally, he always seems to meet me right there where I'm at. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you. Joshua 1.3 Beside the literal ground, unoccupied for Christ, there is the unclaimed, untrodden territory of divine promises. What did God say to Joshua? Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you. And then he draws the outlines of the land of promise. All theirs on one condition that they shall march through the length and the breadth of it and measure it off with their own feet. 
They never did that to more than one third of the property. And to put it bluntly, that's kind of what's the problem with Israel today. Why is it so small? They never took the land like they were supposed to. And consequently, they never had more than one third. They had just what they measured off and no more. That's kind of why a lot of times when people get into this thing about Israel and what Abraham was promised, Abraham was promised a lot, but what Israel did was less. You see, just because you're promised something doesn't mean you actually appropriate it for yourself. You have to do something on your part. Oh, sure, I can promise you the moon, but unless you go there, you won't get it. <laughs> That's kind of what happened to Israel, and that's why Israel, the nation today, is so small. They didn't appropriate, or they didn't march off with their own feet, the places where God said to go. Sure, if they'd have marched off today, Israel would be a giant nation. But guess what? God's going to give them a second chance, because the 144,000, I believe, will go in and march out all that Israel did not do with the promises that Abraham was given, but now we'll do with the promises of God, what God has given to the children of Israel once they become children of the Messiah, once they become sons and daughters of God. In Second Peter, we read of the land of promise that is opened up to us, and it is God's will that we should, as it were, measure off that territory by the feet of obedient faith and believing obedience, thus claiming and appropriating appropriating it for our own. I love when they try to make a metaphor out of that. When they want to say, well, you know, you can put it to your rubber meets the road, so to speak, and you can walk the talk, you know, by walking it literally. And I think that really, if you were stupid enough to walk it, God is smart enough to honor it. You don't have to have a lot of faith. I think God really wants to see if you're going to be obedient. And I think that's what he did with Abraham when it was with sacrificing Isaac. Was Abraham going to be obedient even unto death? How many of us have ever taken possession of the promises of God in the name of Jesus? Here is the magnificent territory for faith to lay hold on to and march through the length and the breadth of faith has never done yet. Let us enter into all of our inheritance and let us lift up our eyes to the north and to the south and to the east and to the west and hear him say all the land that thou seest I will give to you now I don't know about you but to me that's a little hokey I'm sorry but I don't see it nowadays because we're kind of living in the last days you know and no you're not going to get you know riches beyond measure you're not going to get rings on your fingers and bells on your toes so you'll have music wherever you go you're not going to get, you know, all this prosperity that you think you want because God really, if he gives it to you, no offense, I'm not so sure that it's something that you weren't going to choke on in the end like the children of Israel did when they wanted meat. Be careful what you ask for because God might give it to you and if it's abundantly beyond what you should have, maybe you should be giving it away and keeping it for yourself today. One of the things about Abraham's promise and the children of Israel's doing is that you have to do something with your faith. Faith without works is dead. You have to do something about this life God has given you. Not just an abundant life or some plan for your life, but you have to do something with caring about other people because Jesus died for you. He wanted you to go and demonstrate the same love that you received from God to other people. You see, that's putting your actions into your faith. That's putting your feet where your talk is, or putting your shoes where your mouth is, and you're not sticking your foot in it. You need to put your feet into action by going to the place where God wants you to be, so that your words would catch up with what your actions are doing rather than your words saying what you will do and your actions proving that you won't. That's why God gives us his word. He has already said, look, I promised you that you can have it. Now you need to go out and do it. I promised you that you could reap the harvest. All you need to do is open your mouth and ask. I 
really believe with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, that if you sat down in the morning and said, Lord, you know, who do you want me to talk to? And then you got up in the daytime and you said, okay, I'll go talk to him. You know, and sure enough, God will bring people across your path that you'll talk to. And you just, you don't have to share with them the gospel necessarily or some poor spiritual laws or work up some routine from whatever, the master's teaching or some other thing that you've been Bible studied about. Why not just talk to people, you know, where they're at? And say, hey, you know, I'm a Christian, but, you know, I'd like to talk to you. You know, what do you want to talk, you know, I'd like to talk to you about God. You know, do you, do you believe that there is a heaven? You know, most people tell you straight up, no, they don't. You know, talk to them about what you believe. You know, what you know you believe, not what you think you believe. Because one thing that'll happen, you'll change <laughs> very quickly your way of approaching people. Because a lot of times your superficiality will come out. You'll show how little you know or how much you know about God. I like to tell people, hey, look, I don't care if you go to heaven or you go to hell. That's your choice. You know, it doesn't matter to me. You know, but prove whether he exists or not. You know, you go somewhere and you know, get along with God and talk to him. You sit down with the Bible and see if it's true. You ask Jesus if he would reveal himself to you. Because I know he will. Because he did. Now, you may not know that. You may argue about it and you know, you can play the game, you know, but let's be real, you know. I can't see what you're gonna do when you leave, you know, after talking to me. I don't know what you're about, you know, if you wanna ask Jesus in your life, fine, we could do that, but I don't really care. But someplace at some point in time, you need to care. You need to do something about it. Because, frankly, God's the one who's saying it. I'm not. You know, and a lot of times, you know, people you know, will react differently at different times to that particular way of sharing. Other times, it's just, hey, you know, I've, I've gone directly and confronted someone and said, look, you don't believe it? Fine. Here's a Bible. Open it. You know, you you prove it. Here, here, take this Bible right now. Think of something that you want to ask God about and flip it open. And they flipped it open and sure enough got pissed off because God spoke to them. And I'm serious. Really. I have done that quite a few times in my life. And most of the time, the people got pissed off because God did speak to them and they admitted it. I don't know what he said to them. Don't know what they had in their mind. But sure enough, the shoe fit and they had to walk in it. And that's kind of what you have to do with your faith. You have to find what works for you and walk in it. You have to be the example of what you say you are. Otherwise, don't do it. Don't pretend what you aren't. And don't contend for something you don't know. Rather, find out what you are. Know what you believe in and stick with it. Keep it simple if you have to, you know, use the keep it simple stupid, you know, or just Share your testimony. Say, look, I don't know anything about you know Bible or Gospel or whatever all that stuff is, but I do know how I got saved, and you could share that. But the point is, what you put on your feet is going to determine how far you go. If you're wearing high heels and pumps, believe me, you're not going to walk a mile in someone else's shoes, are you? No, you're going to stand there and look pretty, because that's all you can do. But if you're putting on running shoes, then you know what you're there for. And that's kind of what the preparation of the gospel of peace is all about. They were the shoes that were told to put on as the full armor of God. And that's what you're supposed to be able to do is to get ready to be able to give to every man an answer for the hope that lies within you. Why do you believe what you believe? Why are you happy today? Why are you able to go through trials and tribulations without freaking out you know, and losing it? Why do you go to church on Sunday? Why do you do what you do? Why do you pray? Why do you think you're talking to God? What have you proven about the existence of God to yourself? What have you learned this last Sunday from God himself or from your pastor or teacher or church or elder or deacon or whatever it is that you do on Sunday? What have you put on your feet You know, as far as getting ready for the preparation of the gospel of peace? Are you really doing what God said to do or are you just talking the talk without really walking the walk? I don't know. I know for me, you wouldn't be watching this video if I wasn't doing what I said and saying what I do. And this is what I do. I love it. I'm slowing down. I'm enjoying more of what I do in my garden and 
the little things that you know I can afford to do. You know, once in a while I'll go dancing. <laughs> I still go dancing. Yeah, I'm getting old, but and I'm dancing less. But I'm having fun. But the reality of what I'm here for and what I do is up to God to decide and not me. Because really, if I didn't have my devotionals, if I didn't have my Bible, if I didn't have Vidivo, if I didn't have the Word of God, if I didn't have Jesus, and if I didn't have God in my life, I'd be dead. There's no doubt about it. You know, I would have despaired of life and gotten bored with it and moved on to something else. But the truth is, God makes my life worth living. God makes me enjoy the moments of my life when I can see His finger, when I can hear His voice, when I can walk in His Spirit, when I can talk to and know that He will talk to me. Then I look at this whole thing we call Christianity and I say, yeah, I'm loving it because I'm living it.